hey guys, how many of you like relationships, right? Relationships can be some of the most wonderful things in the world that you and I face and some of the most difficult things we face. But all relationships pretty much come from God. God is the author of all relationships. Before there was creation, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they were three, and they had and one, and yet they had perfect synergy and perfect relationship. And out of that love, they created us and the universe. So how do you and I deal with relationships? We've been talking about that primarily when focusing on how do we all get along in a culture that's divided on many different ways. We as the church should shine forth the unity of Jesus Christ. The world is looking for that. We talked about that the very first week. And, uh, and I don't know where you are right now in your relationships, but it can get complicated, right? I'm in a relationship, and it's complicated. Can I just say something to you you might not want to hear? That if you're in a relationship and it's complicated, chances are there's a problem with sin. Let me tell you why. Sin complicates your life. The love of God simplifies your life. The more twists and turns and, and all this other junk that takes place in our lives, you know, it's so simple. When you are loved by God and you love him back, you can love each other without all the web of what does this person mean by that, what does this mean, and have ulterior motives. Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of all that nonsense? Well, the best relationship you can have is with God, and when we love him properly and love him well and let him have his way, our relationships get better. And so we'll be talking today about how we're supposed to work together. This is what we've been focusing on in the book of Corinth, Corinth, which was a city the Apostle Paul was writing to. It was a divided city. There was a church there that was functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders were taking place. People were getting healed. All great things were taking place. At the same time, there were divisions. There were lawsuits against other believers. There was immorality like you would not even believe that was going on. There was, it was a society that was plagued with all kinds of horrible things. There was, there was Temple of Aphrodite and, and, and all these different um, gods they would try to worship. There was prostitution was everywhere as part of religious ceremonies. People would go, get drunk, go with the prostitute and come to church. I mean, it was like, you think it's bad now. It was really, really bad. And the Apostle Paul is talking to a society that's full of violence, hate, racism. Now, we don't have that today, do we, guys? No, no. They make matters worse. There was even some people that had different likes. Like, I like this church better. I like this pastor better. This is the right way to worship God. And they were arguing, and they had their different preferences, and it became sources of division. And the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this. He says, I appeal you to brothers... By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. Wouldn't that be nice if we could all agree? Don't you wish everyone could agree with you? <laughs> Hence, that's the problem. Remember we did this a couple weeks ago? I asked you to say your name as loud as you could. It's chaos. Then I said, say the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, the whole room resounded with the name of Jesus. My friends, that is the answer to our lives. He says, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree that there be some no divisions among you, but you should be united in the same mind and the same judgment. The same mind and the same judgment. Well, how are we supposed to have the same mind? Right? How are we supposed to have the same mind with all these complications? Now, have you guys noticed sometimes that families can be a little difficult to deal with? Have you ever noticed that sometimes the outlaws or the in-laws I heard a story of a man that was in, in Jerusalem with his family, and his mother-in-law was with him, and unfortunately, she, she passed away, and the local authorities gave him two options. They said, listen, you can have a burial for your mother-in-law here for $150, or you can fly her home for $10,000. He goes, no, I, I, want her, I want her back home. And the, funeral, the undertaker said, can I ask you, sir, why is it that you wouldn't take the opportunity to bury it in the Holy Land? $150, bucks. why do you want to spend ten grand?" He said, listen, about 2,000 years ago, there was a man that died here. And after three days, he rose again from the dead. <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. So we all love our mother-in-laws, right? If you're offended, get over yourself. The Bible said, I was glad when they told a joke in church. 
three Bucci 17. Okay. But I, I appeal to you, there'd be no divisions that you'd be the same mind. How's that supposed to happen? Especially right now. Have you noticed what's going on? I don't need to tell you what's going on in our country. I'm tired of all the division. How about you? And everyone has an opinion, but it's not an opinion. It's, it's truth. I have my truth. This is the way it's got to be. If it's not this way, it's not going to work out. We hear this all the time, don't we? Well, how do you and I deal with that? How do we have the same mind of Christ? How do we do that? And so I want to encourage you. This is what our basic text today is. The basic premise of today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. It says this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we would instruct him? Uh, by, the, by, by the way, have you noticed how many people are trying to instruct God and the Bible? Have you noticed they're trying to rewrite the Bible according to their own image? We're trying to make God in our own image instead of the opposite way. Who are we that we should instruct God, right? But we're striving to have the mind of Christ. Is that what it says? We we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We don't have to make it happen. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you and I have the mind of Christ. So it's not a matter of us trying to drum it up and create the uh, mind of Christ. Just like I cannot wish an apple tree to arrive right here on the stage, what I need to do is I need to get the seeds and I need to put the seeds in fertile soil and the seeds will begin to germinate or an oak tree. Or, right? And so you get that in there and you put that acorn in there and you cultivate that acorn. The acorn has all the properties it needs. All it needs is to facilitate water and good soil and sunlight and it will begin to do its own thing. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you receive the mind of Christ. You don't have to produce the mind of Christ. Religion would try to get you to produce something you cannot produce. So what we have to do is let the mind of Christ come into us. Well, how do you do that? We're going to get into that today. But understand that if you've asked Christ, Lord, I'll give you my life. You have the mind of Christ. How do we get it right? You see, the problem is we have the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man, and the two are not always in the same place. How do we get the mind of Christ? Now, what we're going to do, everybody, we're just going to read the Bible. We're going to read about 16 verses, and then we're going to discuss how you and I can have the mind of Christ and be at peace with God and each other. Wouldn't that be nice? All right. You guys ready? All right. We're continuing on here. We're at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, starting at verse 1. And I, this is the Apostle Paul writing, by the way, is that I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech. In other words, I was not a great orator. I was not amazing. We mentioned in the first chapter, the Apostle Paul said, uh, some people say, I'm of the Apostle Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Jesus. And has Christ been divided? Uh, we're just mere workers. He says, when I came to you, I was not this amazing speaker. In fact, we can see in another, script, another passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul says, I'm not one of these super apostles. These pastors that come into your town that are so amazing, they make you feel good, they sing, look, they look good, they sound good, they're amazing. I, I, I'm not a great orator. In fact, there was a rumor going around saying if this is about the Apostle Paul, he actually talks about it. He says, people often say that my letters are weighty, but my speech is contemptible. And so they're kind of, you know, that's what they're doing. He said, brethren, I, I came to you to not come with the excellence of speech or wisdom declaring you the testimony of God. You have to understand that Athens, Greece was, was not far away and it was a place of intellectual proudness, right? Great wisdom of the day, great orators. So you had great intellectual capacity. You also had licentious, crazy things going on in the flesh. And you had religion, all kinds of religion, yet Christianity within the church, there were people fighting. There was immorality that was worse in the church that was outside. And the Apostle Paul is dealing with this. What does he say? When I came to you, I did not come with excellent speech, wisdom declaring you the testimony of God. For I determined to not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
That the only, only hope I have is Jesus and him crucified. It's not about what I think. In fact, the Apostle Paul will say it later on in Galatians. He says this. He says, listen, if anyone comes to you and speaks a different gospel than what we preached, the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me, right? If anyone comes to you with a different gospel, even an angel from heaven, and then he says this, even if I preach something different than you received, in other words, I do not make it up. I'm under authority. He says, follow me like I follow Christ. If I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. The apostle Paul even commends the Bereans in the book of Acts, which was an, uh, an area of called Berea, and they would check the scriptures to make sure what the apostle Paul lined up with the word of God. So the apostle Paul said, it's not about me. It's about Christ crucified. It's about him and we are to follow. Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. How do we get sent? We get sent the walking dead. You and I should be dead men and dead women walking. The good news is when you and I are dead, we are well fed with the Spirit and joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control becomes our fruit because we're designed to flow in complete surrender to God. And when that happens, we shine forth beauty and light. When we choose not to do that, we see destruction. And it's really what it's an invitation for life. Who doesn't want a better life? You see, all of us want a better life, but we're chasing different things that are not of God. Brethren, I came to you not with excellence of speech or wisdom, but I determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote a third of the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest minds that ever was and God utilized him powerfully and, and, and actually to actually author scripture. Look what he says here. He says, I was with you and what? What? Yeah. He, he says weakness. He was in fear. If the apostle Paul had weakness and struggled with fear, it's okay if you struggle with fear or fear of weakness. As long as that does not define you, it's something you might battle with. And the apostle Paul did not let his fear or his weakness, listen to this, and fear and much trembling. The guy was, he was trembling. And my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of dunamis power. I didn't come with excellent speech. I came fearful. I was struggling, but I kept following God. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing despite fear, despite depression. Despite anxiety, that's not going to define me. The Lord Jesus is going to define me, and I rely upon him. When I am weak, he is strong. So in this world, you and I will have trouble at times. Okay, sometimes life gets difficult, but tough times don't last. The Spirit of God lasts. And so we have to say, I, am, I got to think ahead. The only way you and I can truly think logically is we have to have an eternal perspective. Our mind needs to see life, not from the here and now, but who we are both now and forevermore, which we'll get into in a few moments. But in demonstration of the spirit and power, we need now today more of the demonstration of the spirit and power. Not for showboating, but to become more like Jesus Christ. Look what he says here. That your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but the dunamis of God, the power of God, not the power of men, but the power of God. That's where we should rest, not in my ability or inability, but in God's nobility in me. However, we speak the wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, by the way, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
the hidden wisdom of God, which God ordained before the ages of our, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Let me explain what that means. In other words, people had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea that it was God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross. In fact, you can read that scripture verse and in taking the context of the rest of the Bible, it's very likely that the enemy himself, the devil, didn't even understand the significance of Jesus going to the cross because if he knew that was the nuclear option that blew up the kingdom of the enemy, he would have never allowed it to take place. He would have never tried to kill Jesus. Now, I, I just want you to hold on for a second here because this might help us. The church, the believers of that day did not understand how the Messiah was going to come. They had it all figured out. And when Jesus came as a suffering servant instead of a conquering king, they rejected it because they had their eschatology, their end times theology all figured out. As he came the first time, he will come the second time. God is going to come through Jesus Christ and surprise everyone. So when people say, I know exactly how it's going to happen, point A, and I put a chart behind me, and I tell you exactly how Christ is going to come, and you better believe this particular theory, you're, you're, you're being foolish. Because as he didn't tell us the first time, he's going to come. He tells us the grand scope of what's going to happen, but not the details. Because if they knew, they would have never happened. Are you guys tracking with me here? Yeah. So don't divide over eschatology. With the Bible's plain and clear, he's coming back. And so this is what happened. They, they rejected Jesus because their, their study of the end times was wrong. When he comes back a second time, we're not going to get it all right. Because it, the element of surprise, the element of surprise, they didn't know what they were doing. You think Satan knew what he was doing? Likely not, because if we would have known, they would have done it. Now, do we study end times? Yes, but we study the main picture that Christ is coming back, and he's going to tell us on a need-to-know basis. We're going to have the pictures there. We're going to have the pieces. Ah, this is how it works together. You guys follow me. So we study the end times. We look for his coming, but we understand that God, we're going to have to be relying upon him more than our teachers, more than our theories. We're going to have to continue to look at the scriptures and let the Holy Spirit, and it's okay to discuss. You see, but it's written, no eye has, eye has not seen or heard nor has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I used to read that and think, oh, that's the by and by. That's not the by and by. That's the here and now and the by and by. He's quoting the scriptures and he's paraphrasing. He's saying, no eye has seen what God has in store for those who love him. You see, God is revealing mysteries to us both now and forevermore. And we are eternal beings. This is only the beginning. We're going to have an amazing opportunity to be with God forever and ever and see things and experience things we never would dream of. And this is what he says. But God has revealed them, how? Through his spirit. So how do you and I know what's going to happen? We need to know it through the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go, that the paraclete could come. He will show you and lead you to all truth. He will remind you of what I've said. You see, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man. In other words, you don't know what's going on except the spirit of the person. So for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him, right? No one knows exactly what I'm thinking except for me, and I barely know what I'm thinking. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God, right? Only God knows his mind. No one has the mind of God completely and understands it all. We have the mind of Christ, but we're not the commanding center of God's mind. Now, we've received not the spirit of the world. See, there's a spirit of the world. But the Spirit, who is what? From God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us. These things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches. But 
which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him. That's why the world can't understand. It's like being in an algebra class, and you're like, what on earth are they talking about? I don't get it. I don't get it. And then, one, and then all of a sudden, you've ever happened to you, you're in a math class or something, it goes, oh, I see it now. But before that happens, you don't get it. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he gives you vision to see things you're not going to see in your natural. See, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You need to have the discernment of the Holy Spirit. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we would instruct him? Now, this is the part I really want you to understand here. This is so important. But we have the mind of Christ. You and I have the mind of Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, you have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? It means you have the mind of Christ. <laughs> you don't have to produce it. You don't have to make it happen. You have to let it happen. Let it happen, not make it happen. The Bible says so clearly in Philippians, the Apostle Paul says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. It's like that acorn that you bury in the heart. Our job is not to make the acorn tree grow. Our job is to cultivate the soil, to water, to give sunlight. And when the weeds come, we pull the weeds. So we should be pulling each other's weeds, not smoking the weeds. That's for some of you. Hopefully not. But we should seriously, I mean, it's about that. We want to help cultivate that, right? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, what it is, it's a battle. There's a battle for your mind. You see, the epicenter of what controls you, the the hard drive, the operating system of your life pretty much in many ways is the, is the operation mechanism called your mind. And we're going to get into it in a few moments, but how you manage that. And so what feeds you, what, what feeds you leads you. What feeds you leads you. What are you feeding in your mind? You see, how are we driven? Are we carnal driven? In other words, I'm driven by my my passions. I'm hungry, therefore I eat, which is fine. I feel this way, and I'm going to give my body to these things that even though the Bible says it's wrong, I have to, I, I'm a man, and a man's got to do. Boys will be boys, right? My flesh controls me. If I'm hungry, I overeat. There's gluttony. There's all kinds of nonsense that you and I can get involved with debauchery, you name it, right? Because I'm driven by my flesh. If you're driven by your flesh, good luck. Your flesh can inform you, but it should not perform everything for you. The flesh informs, and we have to control it. So that doesn't work. Have you noticed? Yeah. I didn't want to get up today. Wow, I was tired. Hmm, try to hold a job. Okay. <laughs> then we had a second types of people. By the way, we're driven by all these. The soulish man. And this is the part that all of us, a lot of us stay at. It's moved by human emotions and intellect. Well, I'm very, I'm very intelligent, and I, I know how to parse the Greek, and I know the Hebrew, uh, I know the Hebrew culture, I know all the words, I understand the whole historical context, and or maybe I'll, I flow in the spirit because I had, I, I felt, I felt goosebumps on the back of my arms. That must be the Holy Spirit. So if we act emotional, we say it's spiritual. And it may not be just your emotions. Can I just say, I felt the Spirit of God come on me last night watching the Yankee game. <laughs> I was destroyed when Aaron Judge struck out and Jose Trevino had a chance to clear the bases and he pop flied. <laughs> I felt the anointing of depression come on me. <laughs> right? Or you, know, or, you, or, you know, you stand up and, and, and you, hear, you sing the Star Spaniel banger, God bless them. I know the whole stadium is singing, and all of a sudden you have goosebumps. Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's called your emotions. 
Does the Holy Spirit speak through your emotions? Yes. Does he speak through your mind? Yes. But we cannot live by our human intellect or our human emotions and let that inform us. Well, I feel this way. We have, in our culture today, in the church today, I've heard it many times, we worship the God of happiness. I want to be happy. It's like we have the Walmart smiling face plastered in our minds. If it makes me smile, I'll stay a while. It's all about my happy. I wasn't happy because after all, God says, I've come to make you happy, right? That's what it's all about. And we've been taught that in our culture, the pursuit of what? Happiness. Well, you know, that's nice and that's good to a certain degree. Maybe it's good sort of in a governmental sense, but the pursuit of happiness is, is not a defined. It's defined by what you think, but the pursuit of God is what we should go after. So we have the carnal driven and we have the soul driven and we have the spirit driven. This is where we need to live. Led by the Holy Spirit in keeping with the word of God. So what we want to do, this is the deal, everybody. You see, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Who am I that I could instruct God? God's ways are so much higher and greater. It'd be absolutely ridiculous for me to instruct God. You see, the problem is we often can be carnal driven. And let me give you an illustration. Jesus was speaking to his disciples and said to them in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 16, he, he said, what do people say? Who, who do people say the Son of Man is? Some, well, some people say you're, you're a prophet. Some say this. But who do you say I am? And Peter, God bless Peter, says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah. Jesus goes, whoa. He says, whoa, Peter, flesh and blood. Did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven. And Peter, on this confession that I am the Messiah, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's Peter. <laughs> <laughs> How about that, guys? You know, he's probably strutting a little bit and has a little swagger in his step. He's feeling pretty good about himself because why? He heard from the Spirit of God. And now it happens to us too. I hear from the Spirit of God. Well, God moved through me. And then all of a sudden, I, I got this guy. I'll talk to you later. And then Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to be beaten, crucified. And now, if I were to tell you today, hey, church, I know it's pastor's appreciation, but I'm going to suffer. I'm going to go through difficult times, and I'm going to die. Who, which one of us, hopefully, would say, no, we don't want that to happen to you, right? What kind of friend would you, would you be if you wanted bad things to happen to me, right? Of course you're saying, oh, if we were to take a survey, what's the right thing for Peter to do? If we don't know the rest of the story, we'd say, he's got to sell Jesus. What does it take for me to protect you? I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to go through a difficult time. I want you to be happy. I want you to, do, to flourish. And I want you to be the Messiah so I can be on the winning team. I, I, God forbid that you have to suffer, Jesus. Please don't suffer. Would that not be the right thing to say? Does that not make sense? The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you've had to do unto you. So I'm following Scripture. Scripture says, i got to look out for Jesus and protect him. Right? That's clearly in Scripture. So he thinks. So what does he do as Jesus talks about this? A, a couple verses earlier in the same conversation time. He says, God forbid that you have to suffer. And what does Jesus say? But he turned and said to Peter, what? Get behind me, Satan. What? You are a hindrance to me for you're not setting what? Not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of who? Men. So my friends, we cannot rely just upon what we think. 
So one moment we, we can be hearing from God and the next moment we're taking the scriptures and bending them to what we think and we're hearing from our own mind, human understanding. We can't get it. We have to rely completely on God. Jesus says, I do nothing unless I see the Father doing it. Do you follow that? So it's constantly, we need to feed from the Spirit of God. I cannot trust my own intellect. I need the Spirit of God. I need to take my hose, if you will. I need to take a conduit, and I need to hook up to heaven and let the Spirit of God flow inside of me, which we'll share in a few moments, so I can see what's really going on. I cannot see the natural. Let me ask you guys a question. Here's a picture up there. Um, what do you guys see there? Oh, you guys are too spiritual for the rest of us. People are like, I see Jesus. Okay, all right, all right, relax, okay. If you don't see Jesus, you're normal. No, I'm just kidding. But no, if you look at that picture, go ahead and squint. Start closing your eyes. What do you see now? That isn't Jesus. This is a dude with the beard, with the beard okay? But for the, for, the pur- for the purpose of Jesus, doesn't look like that, okay? We, we make Jesus a hippie. He's not a hippie. But anyhow, let's just say, it looks like Jesus, right? Well, what happens? You have to squint. You have to close your eyes, and you have to see with the eyes of your faith and not your intellect. You need the Spirit of God to show you. So what, my friends, we need to do is we need to stop using human intellect and human wisdom, and we need to focus and use the Spirit of God to see what's going on. Do not trust your eyes. You have to trust the Word of God because the Word of God is forever and evermore. So, we love children here. God bless you. The Bible says, suffer not the children, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So we have three parts of our body. We have, in our way, if you will, you might disagree, but that's fine. But let's just say for this, we have the body, we have the soul, and we have the spirit. When you and I, Adam and Eve, our first parents, when they sinned, they had a direct communication with God through their spirit. But when they sinned, something died in them. Their spirit man became deaf. And so what happened, let me, let me kind of just explain it even a little bit more, if you will. You have the body. It's obvious, your body, right? Then you have the soul. What's the soul? The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions, right? That's what the soul is. And so what we want to do, a mind is the area that kind of controls what we think controls things. We have our will and we have our emotions. And so then you have something else is you have the Holy Spirit. When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, then what happens is the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he begins to regenerate you. He becomes like a general contractor that moves in the middle of your heart. Jesus says the Spirit will show you all things, lead you into God's truth. So now what happens is he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So therefore, we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you. It doesn't say work out your salvation, get your act together. It doesn't say that. It says work out your salvation and fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. So what we need to do is say, yes, Holy Spirit, you're the general contractor. Go ahead and take my rest of my house and put it in order. So what it is, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the kingdom of God. It's fellowship with God. So what we want to do, everybody, is allow the Spirit to inform our mind, our will, our emotions, and my body. I am not controlled by these things. I'm going to inform them who they need to listen to. My will has to bow. So how do you do that? So what we want to do, everybody, sorry, what we want to do, if I get this thing working correctly, oh, there it is, What we want to do is get the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? Allow the Holy Spirit by reading the Scriptures. We read the Scriptures. It's like seed. You need to give seed. And when the seed takes the water of the Spirit, 
it comes alive. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So every time you and I think a wrong thought or something, we're building these walls. We're building these bricks. And if we don't, if we allow those bricks to build, there comes a fortress in our life and the enemy hides behind those walls and takes attacks upon us based upon a thought life that we took. We took the materials of his lives and we built a stronghold. What we need to do is change that. So what we want to do is get the word of God in us and let the Holy Spirit come out of us this way, and we input the Bible. You see that, everybody? So there's an inter interchange that is taking place. So it's a battle of the mind. It's the battle of the mind. If I get this correct here, I'm, if I, I'm, I'm so sorry. Hang on a second, guys. Uh, it's locked up on me. There, there, there she is. Okay. The battle of your mind. It's the renewing of the mind. That's what we're talking about here. The Bible says, I what? I urge you, brethren, by a hard work and determination, by the mercy. In other words, God's going to give you the strength. By the mercies of God, present. Does it say present your bodies? When I go to a shower, I don't, what I do is I turn it on because it's there already. Right? The water's coming in the house. I, I give an opportunity to turn, and then I present myself to the shower head. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> How many of you love showers? I love showers. You know, I get in that I present myself to the water, and the water cleanses. I can't clean myself without the water. You can't change without the Spirit. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living, holy sacrifice. In other words, I'm going to die all the time. I'm, you got to be the walking dead, as we talked about acceptable which God is your spiritual service. Now, here's a part. And do not be conformed, in other words, shaped, like a cookie cutter. Don't let the world shape you. You see, we're communicable. There's communicable diseases, and there's communicable spirituality. There's communicable ideas and emotions. We are influenced by each other, whether you realize it or not. You need to understand that. Even the, 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 the prophet said, I'm among an unclean people. And I'm unclean. Just by us, it's like getting secondhand smoke. You ever had secondhand smoke? Back in the 1980s, everyone smoked. Have you noticed that? I used to go to these places, and I come back from a restaurant, I smoke. I, smoke. I didn't smoke, but I had to put my jacket outside and let the fresh air come upon me. I had to take a shower because the secondhand smoke got on me. There's the secondhand smoke of the Word. If you're not aware of it, you start smelling like the world. You need to wash yourself with the water of the Word every day to hear from God. Do not be conformed but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. Now look at this. Back to Philippians. Another chapter says this. Let this mind be in you. It doesn't say make it. It's just let it. We need to let the mind of God hum in our lives. Let the mind be in you, which was of Christ Jesus, which is humility. You see, what we're talking about here. It's a battle for the mind. It's the renewing of the mind. It's refocus and replace. We talked about this. Don't try to change. Stop doing something. Instead, re replace. Jesus gave an illustration. He says, when uh, demons are driven out of a house, seven demons are driven out. If the place is still empty, more demons come back. So we have to refocus and replace. I remember years ago, Sandra and I, we had these moles in the back backyard. They're horrible little things, little creatures that just come up and wish I had a shotgun. I don't, okay? But I'm like Elmer Fudd. But anyhow, these things were terrible. So there's a guy in our church had a trap. So we put the trap out and we captured the mole and I drove it far away. I'm not supposed to do that, but I did. And I dropped it off. So I'm like, good, we're good now. Well, guess what happened? Those moles made a series of tunnels right by our house a family of skunks moved in. Yeah, you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. One morning, I'm sitting there in the morning. I'm, I mean, it was strong. And the whole house smelled like skunk, like you wouldn't believe. It was worse than the New Jersey Turnpike. It was terrible. It was terrible. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, I, oh these skunks. And then I had to set another trap and get it out. And then I had to fill the holes with something else. You see, it's not about stopping doing something. We have to... Refo replace and refocus and fill with something else. So it's not a matter of stopping doing it. You have to replace these things in our life. You see, this is the important part, everybody. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty for pulling down the strongholds. What we have to do, everybody, is we need to cast down arguments and everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's not just knocking things down, it's replacing them as well. We want to convert our thoughts to distorted sexuality to healthy sexuality, to dysfunctional marriage to a functional marriage to a selfish person, to a generous person, to one that worries all the time, the one that has faith. We want to replace, don't try to stop doing, but change your focus for whatever you feed leads. Whatever you focus upon, you'll drive towards. So we have anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, we need to cast down and build up. You see, how do we do that? Well, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, what is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worth of these praise, what does it say? Think. Get that mind. Remember, the mind is a driver here, right? What happens in the mind gets into the spirit. What's in the spirit should get to the mind. The mind is the area that you and I sort of control. But then there's the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, and the enemy wants you to get the wrong thoughts to build these fortresses to get into your subconscious. Now your subconscious is the running program. You don't even know what's going on. It's pushing all these buttons in your life because you've been programmed to worry and all these other problems. Now we have to something called cognitive therapy. The Bible talks about it here in Philippians. We have to renew our minds. And the Bible even says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the same word used for a, an ugly caterpillar with a bunch of ugly legs that you want to step on and the green comes out can I hear an amen you guys need to grow up <laughs> to that caterpillar getting into a chrysalis isolating itself building a structure you need to you need to isolate yourself at times build a structure of faith build a structure of reading the word of God being in community together and taking it in and let it transform your mind your mind and the renewing takes place is something called a metamorphosis well God will literally rewrite your brain which will rewrite your spirit and there's a synergy going on not just cognitive therapy because we do know you can have neural pathways it's neural pathways Pathways combined with spiritual pathways under the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do things we'd never think possible. So we got to think about these things. This may not be scripture, but it's true. All truth is God's truth. So a thought. Right? And you reap an action. Think, do Sow an act, and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap character. Sow a character, and you reap destiny. Listen, this is what we have to do. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, there's something dead inside of you. What we want to do is have the Holy Spirit to be a general contractor of our lives. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living Lord. I just want to say to God, God, thank you that I have the mind of Christ already. Now, Lord, I take in the water of your word, cultivate this word in my mind. And so what we do is we help feed it. We feed our body by not listening to it, but doing the right thing. We feed our soul, right? We feed our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions are instructed by the word of God. So what you, what you feed upon will lead you. So you start taking in the word of God. It soaks into your body. It soaks into your mind. You will, and it even leaks into your spirit. So you, you participate bringing the stuff in. And then the Holy Spirit is the amazing river that's living. And he will fire out and bring to life and transform all of those. So there's a synergy that takes place between you and I together. Are you tracking with me? So, but we have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? Notice, it doesn't say I. It says what? What does we mean? Community. 
If it's I have the mind of Christ, look out. I can see a cult coming any moment now. But we have the mind of Christ. I, according to the Apostle Paul, see through a glass darkly. So you and I need to see God together. And we have the mind of Christ. The Bible says, understand the will of the Lord. Be not drunk with wine, which leads to all kinds of problems, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in spiritual songs and making melody in your heart that the Lord is near. So we're called to cultivate each other based upon the Word of God, which is pure seed in the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I come together. I have the Spirit of God flowing out of me. And we fill this place with the Spirit of God where it begins to change the environment where we're located. But it all happens because we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much that we have your mind. If we've given our lives to you, we have our mind. Lord, I ask you, we've been out of our minds. We've been out of your mind and into our minds. And when we're in our minds, we're out of our minds. For Father, we recognize that we truly can't think properly without your mind. Jesus, we declare today, we're not gonna listen what our body says. We're not gonna listen to what our society says. We're not gonna listen to what our emotions say. We're going to let them inform us what's going on. But instead, let God be true and every man a liar. We choose to believe your word over our thoughts and our feelings. Holy Spirit, you're the truth. We receive your truth today.